Good afternoon, and welcome to a State of the Market update hosted by Tom Postilio and Mike Conlon. Joining us for an important conversation about the current state of New York real estate market, a review of the July new, new contract signed report, and the opportunities and challenges ahead, are our distinguished guests, Howard M. Lorber, Chief Chairman of Douglas Elliman, and Jonathan Miller, President and CEO of Miller Samuel, and the author of the Elliman Market Report. Go ahead, Mr. Postilio and Mr. Conlon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, that introduction. I get a kick out of the fact that the last time we did this, I was Tony and Mickey, and today it's Tom and Mike. But uh, <laughs> lovely operators, but clearly not on our team. <laughs> so we're 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 thrilled to have everyone together today. We thank all of our uh, clients who have uh, called in to hear uh, this very important discussion, and we are uh, really honored to have both Howard and Jonathan with us this afternoon. They are without question the most important voices in terms of uh, real estate and, and real estate data uh, in New York and, and throughout the country. So uh, we thank you both gentlemen for, for joining us. And don't let that go to your head. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, before we get started, uh, we just want to take a minute to uh, thank this wonderful group of VIP, VIP clients who took time out of their busy schedules to uh, be online with us. And uh, a lot of you have sent us some really terrific questions, and uh, we've discussed some of those with Jonathan and Howard, and um, <coughs> we'll, uh, we'll fold those into our conversation. Yeah, so, so thank you to those of you who, who did send in questions, and, and uh, we will hopefully get to as many of them as we can. So in the context of where we stand at this very moment, so for the first time in history, New York City real estate was shut down. We could not show properties from March 16th through June 21st. And we kind of got the biggest kick out of it. On, on June 22nd, we got like 100 broker emails, that, you know, back to work, back to work. And, and Mickey and I shook our heads. We were like, we've never worked harder in our lives throughout those past three months, you know, trying to uh, keep all of the deals that we struck uh, pre-COVID together, you know, as, as people were trying to renegotiate uh, and, and the, the, the madness of, of, of that moment. But um, fortunately, we were able to uh, to get them all uh through the uh, the closing process, and they, they they've now closed in the last month or so. But uh, yeah, uh, and a lot of people have heard stories and discussed this further uh, about buyers who uh, had gone into contracts pre-COVID who were trying to renegotiate or get out of their contracts. And we had heard stories about discounts five percent, ten percent, and there was a lot of panic in the air. And when we when we had a few contracts that tried to negotiate, and our position was. This is not a housing crisis. This is a virus. Business is simply shut down. It has not changed the value of real estate. So we are declining to renegotiate. And of, of all of the, the most extraordinary thing we saw was one buyer who tried to renegotiate. We refused and made an unprecedented move and walked away from their 10% deposit without a fight. Yeah. And we've never, ever seen that happen but all of the other deals got to the closing table. So it uh, emboldened us uh, to push forward, to hush the naysayers, and to look at the market data for what it is. And it's, it shouldn't be rooted in fear. Yeah, and at the moment, we, we, we've got about 30 sale listings all over the place, co-ops, condos, resales, new dev. Uh, at all price points, all neighborhoods, and we have about a dozen rentals, same thing, all, all price points, all neighborhoods. And we're finding that it's generally slow on all since we've been back to being able to show uh, properties again as of June 22nd. So, uh, and, and for the first time ever, it's very interesting, we've got a lot of sales on the market uh, for both sale and rent at the same time, and, and we're, we're really uh, not seeing a lot of traction uh, in terms of, uh, you know, it's very active, it feels very busy, but, but things are not um, really transacting. So, so Jonathan, your, re your report is out. It, the media is spinning with it all over the place. Uh, it, it's a pretty, uh, it's, it's very revealing, and, and, and so we give you the floor to please, you know, give us all a better understanding of these numbers 
uh, in the context, not just of the time we're living in, but, but also as they uh, relate to, to past market cycles, if you will. Sure, sure. So did you say I had five hours to answer that question? <laughs> uh, we have to cap it for a half. Four, four and a half okay, exactly. all right, fair enough. I, I don't want to uh, cut off Howard either because uh, he has a lot to add to this. Um, what are the uh, – so the contract report, the idea behind it is that uh, in addition to sort of pricing trends and longer-term trends that we develop in the quarterly series that I've been writing with – Douglas Solomon for 25 years uh, is this new series on new side contracts. And uh, we're covering, uh, you know, most of the markets at uh, that elements where elements footprint is across the country, whether it's uh, New York, uh, Florida, California, Aspen, Snowmass, uh, with other markets in development. And the idea behind it is that we're in the middle of uh, an event that seems to be changing on an hourly, daily, weekly, monthly basis. So to supplement what we're doing in, in uh, the other reports, which are more often showing price, pricing trends um, and longer macro trends, um, we're, we have a, a transactional report. And this report series is on Element's website at element.com forward slash market reports and all the uh the regions are, are available and so in the you know that's sort of the housekeeping aspect of this what we're trying to do is show the pulse of the market in the, for the month of whenever the report's released so in the month of july we're only looking at um uh new inventory that was added in the month and we're also looking at only contracts that were signed in the month. And what we've seen in uh, in the Manhattan in Manhattan, and then relating to the region around it, are two different scenarios. So, in the uh, in Manhattan itself, uh, contract activity, while it has been rising since April, is still down about 57 percent year over year. Um, uh, in terms of, you know, what's being signed in a given month. We are seeing inventory rise. Um, inventory is up, but uh, what we've seen across the, across the U.S. is that there's about a 30-day lag time between when contracts sign, uh, contracts rise uh, after when inventory begins to rise, meaning that when a market is released from the lockdown, uh, the first thing that happens for the first month is that inventory rapidly comes on because it was held back at, because we didn't essentially have a spring market. The market was what, you know, a housing market looks like when it's shut down by state mandate. And this happened throughout the United States. Um, what Where Manhattan is lagging is uh, most markets seem to really see a snapback in contracts, you know, within the month. Uh, after the shutdown, and in New York, it's been it's been improving, but it's been at a much slower pace. Uh, when I say New York, I mean Manhattan. And one of the reasons is that March and April, about 40% of Manhattanites actually exited and went to second home markets, or you know bought, or um, you know looked at you know other moved to other uh, temporary moved to other parts of the country. And because the school systems are, you know, in terms of what's going to happen in the fall is very unclear. You know, it's opening, but, you know, some some school private schools aren't opening. It's sort of, you know, all over the place that there isn't this sort of uniform like decision um, being made by market participants. So everybody's sort of, you know, on hold. Um, however, uh, in markets like Brooklyn, which is you know obviously part of the city we're actually seeing a real uptick in um in contracts uh contracts are essentially up uh depending on the property type you know somewhere between you know give or take around 25 percent year over year and uh and actually the brooklyn brownstone market's up over a hundred percent so so it's it's more about Manhattan and the vacancy or exit uh, that occurred in the beginning of the uh, lockdown um, than it is a sort of city versus suburban narrative. 
Uh, the other thing is when you look at uh, the city itself is that, and this is really a misnomer that I think will be corrected going forward, is that, uh, and I still uh, talk to my colleagues, uh, you know, in the valuation business around the country, and they still associate Manhattan or New York City with, you know, we had a COVID problem because of high density, when in fact, it wasn't high density. It was really, um, you know, if you looked at, at the peak, you know, in sort of April uh, of COVID, the infection rates were much higher in, um, in markets like Staten Island and the outer reaches of Brooklyn and Queens and Manhattan. And they have the lowest density, but they're very suburban-like. So to say that the city is inferior or less safe than the suburbs Density is, a, is certainly a factor, but it's not the issue. The issue is really wealth and mobility, um, and, and that has played out. We have, you know, in this report, we talk about the Hamptons, which, you know, sales are up a hundred, more than 100% year over year, and uh, the upward trajectory literally has been a rocket ship since, uh, since April. And uh, it even started a little ahead of when the state, uh, you know, pulled back in uh, first uh, in early June, allowed the market to reopen. Um, uh, and then other markets like the suburbs, um, like uh, Westchester and Fairfield, uh, you know, we're seeing actually um, greater growth in contract activity at the higher end. The higher end in the suburbs have has been asleep since the financial crisis, and now we're seeing it it increased and i think some of that is coming at the expense of manhattan and other is just this sort of release of pent-up demand because there was no spring market um sure. you know, because of the lockdown as, and that's as, sort of the said, sort of the top line uh, got it. overview as you as you said on one of the previous uh, town hall calls with our company with all the agents of the country the, the, you know, the, the, the second quarter in new york didn't exist. It was surgically removed from the calendar. So we're, we're kind of right. having it simultaneous with the third quarter. But as you know, uh, you were very helpful to us with our own appraisals. You know, we have a home in Nissaquag, Long Island, and uh, where we have never spent as much time as we are uh, have been lately. So, you say uh, that so excitedly. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. It's, it's great. I never, uh, never spent as much time here, and we've never worn less neckwear. Yeah, and, and, uh, and, I, and I've learned that, you know, I, I shouldn't try my hand at gardening because the first day I decided to pull some weeds, I pulled out my back. So, but, oh. uh, but I digress. But 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 this area too. I mean, we're getting you know we have we expanded our team to uh, to Long Island as well, and we, we're getting a lot of calls from locals here asking about the values of their home and you know if they're waterfront or if they have a pool, et cetera. So there's uh, you know Long Island seems to be booming as well. Uh, Jonathan, uh, yes, I just be curious. Absolutely. Much, with the, uh, the the booming Long Island market, for instance, how much do you think is uh, just the natural progression of that market from where we were pre-COVID? to um, the quote unquote exodus from the city? So uh, if you look at a uh, suburban market like Long Island, um, you know, first of all, Long Island, and when I say Long Island, I'm really talking about Long Island without the Hamptons and the North Fork. And mm -hmm. uh, since the financial crisis, Long Island has uh, been by far this, has seen the strongest growth in both activity and prices uh, that, you know, we haven't seen the, you know, as much strength as, you know, in Westchester and Fairfield County specifically. Um, and one of the things, one of the characteristics has been of that market has been, it's been soft at the top, uh, like the North shore and tighter as you move lower in price. However, like I was saying earlier, um, the strongest, uh, growth, you know, if we look at percent change year over year, the strongest growth rate in the Long Island single family market has been above a million dollars uh, on a year over year basis, July over July. Uh, contract activity, meaning the number of contracts are up 151 percent. And wow. And so, so as a result, um, so, but you know, the rest of the market is also seeing some tremendous growth, but, but there's a increasing progression of strength as we move higher in price. And I think um, the higher priced aspect of it, um, part of that is coming from the city. 
Um, and then the rest of it is, you know, essentially a release of pent up demand that you're, you know, um, you're seeing the spring markets planted on, you know, on the uh, June, July market, essentially. And that's where we're, where we're at now. But, you know, it, it's, you know, I think, uh, I don't know if, How if Howard has any thoughts about this, but when I think of this and I think of, okay, so the crisis at some point, fingers crossed, is going to end, there'll be a vaccine, whatever. And then really, what are we left with? Well, we're left with, um, we're left with a housing market that still has Zoom and sort of the relationship between work and home has expanded a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think I, I think I maybe had said this in the call, I don't mean to use the same joke twice, although that's all I seem to be able to do. But uh, you know, if you follow the narrative on the on Manhattan, it's like there's going to be five people left in September. And <laughs> that is not the story at all. It's, of it's a misnomer. Of course not. This whole you know the media just loves to grab on to uh, mass exodus, et cetera. But um, our, our next question is for Howard. But but certainly Howard, uh, anything you want to add to the above, you know, please go go right ahead. But we do our next question. Uh, was for you just just to um, understand in all of the various Douglas Elliman markets throughout the country uh, where we are seeing the greatest strength and where we're kind of struggling. So, sure, um, I agree most of what's said by uh, John, which is unusual, right, John? <laughs> At least it's most. <laughs> but but uh, I do agree the 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 tough the toughest market is New York City. And I'm not so sure, you know, that it's at this point it has anything or, or I shouldn't say anything. It doesn't have much to do with COVID. Well, what I see and what I ask people and talk to people, um, especially at the higher end of the market, which is much of Manhattan, um, it's really more worries about safety and, uh, mm -hmm. and riot, riots and protests and so forth. And that really is, uh, you know, scared a lot of, scared a lot of people. Um, most of the companies that I speak to, most of our competitors, um, if you went through the second quarter, so that was April, May, and June, so we were pretty much closed down most of that except for about eight or ten days in the end of June. We were all down maybe 45%. Uh, you know, we measure it by commissions, of course. Um, you can't spend sales prices. You can only spend commissions. So <laughs> we, were, we were all down probably, I think I've heard a low 40%, a high of 50%. Okay. And that's traditionally been the best market for all of us as far as, uh, you know, paying the bills and, and making some money. Uh, Long Island, uh, I think that uh, Jonathan was correct on. Um, the low middle end has been very strong. The, the high end has never recovered from the financial crisis that started in 08. I mean, there are houses on the north shore of Long Island that – Started on the market a couple of years ago, overpriced at ten, eleven million. Uh, one of them I could think of, and sold for three million a couple of months ago. The prices are, are devastated there, and they have not really come back. There's been a couple of high price sales, but but not a lot. Uh, but the rest of the market there is is pretty solid. Florida has been stellar, um, uh, especially the east coast of Florida. Uh, Probably our business is probably up 30, 40 percent. And uh, the number one market, I think, definitely in the country, maybe the world at this point, has been Palm Beach. Cause wow, I think, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I think people equate that to uh, safe living and, uh, you know, they, they, they just like the feel of it. Uh, Miami has also done well. And also, it's interesting, the uh, single fam, which, which maybe speaks a little bit to New York's issue, the single family home market has been substantially stronger than the condo market in South Florida. And I think that's because people don't want to deal with walking into a building, uh, going through a lobby, you know, the doorman, the concierge, uh, the people by the elevator. It's, it's, you know, during these times, you know, people sort of like to sort of stay away from that. So where can you do that in a single-family house? And uh, my own story as it relates to that is, uh, which is why I think that townhouses, which have been very un very weak in the last number of years in Manhattan, um, I think are going to uh, maybe have a resurgence because uh, the, fa the fact is the, the, new ta the new buildings in New York always pride themselves on all the amenities. 
So I live at one of those buildings. And, you know, right after, I guess around March 15th, when things started closing down, uh, I got a notice uh, from the building that they're closing uh, the gym. And mm. A day or two later, I got a notice that they're closing the pool and the spa. And then another day later, two days later, they're uh, they're um, closing the uh, other most of the other amenities, which was a theater, a pool pool room, a room to play pool, and um, uh, and a library. Then after that, got them noticed they're closing the restaurant. So at the end of the day, they closed pretty much all the reasons that most people paid the exorbitant prices that we paid for these type of buildings. And I said to myself, this is fantastic. I can move into a rent stabilized apartment and uh, they never had the amenities and I won't miss them next time. Yeah. So, so I think that's really been it. And townhouses on the other hand, you could do whatever you want in a townhouse. Okay. Yeah. If you want to have a pool in your town, you can have a pool and they can't close you down. If you have a gym and, and, and also, you know, it, it's sort of, a more comfortable from the point of view if God forbid someone in your family gets sick, you can quarantine them you know on one of the floors in the townhouse, so I think that's an interesting uh, play uh California again space uh, I was going to say space and a lot of air, except the air quality's not that good there usually, although the the <laughs> pandemic really fixed that for a while by the way yeah. sure. California air has been unbelievable uh yeah. I think we're up about uh fifteen percent there. Colorado, we're way up, you know, more than double, maybe triple now. It's a very small market uh, in Aspen, but, you know, people felt you want to go to someplace healthy, that's where you go. The suburbs around New York, Westchester was up, Connecticut was about flat, and then uh, New Jersey was up a little bit, Massachusetts was about flat. So if, now when, you, when we talked about Long Island and Jonathan talked about uh, – we talked about not including the Hamptons, but if you pull out the Hamptons, the Hamptons had a record so far, a record year. Uh, not so much in prices, but in volume and transactions. Uh, first of all, there was a flood of rentals, okay, uh, that people ever wanted. Where everything got rented at prices substantially higher than anyone ever got before. And then one by one, the sales, the houses that have been on the market for you know a few years because they were overpriced, all of a sudden they started selling. So it's been a very good, uh, very good uh, um, market there. And the schools, by the way, the schools are generally relatively small a lot, in a lot of the Sam, a lot of the uh, Hamptons towns and villages. Um, I just got someone sent me uh, uh, from the uh, head of the Board of Education of Smalls of the school system in Quag. Quag is next to West Hampton, east of it. It's a very small town, and uh, they have 75 more students this year than last year. They only had 55 last year. So when you look at wow. it, otherwise, you know, oh 55, they had 75. And they just announced that they're opening, you know, full time. Um, so I think that the schools also played a big role in some of these moves. Um, I know lots of people that said, if they're not opening the schools, I'm moving someplace else where the schools are open. And uh, people have gone, gone as far as registering in another school let's say Florida, okay, a private school, renting an apartment and still waiting to find out whether they really have to move there and use it, depending on what the local schools uh, do do here. Mm. So there's a lot of uncertainty and so forth, but obviously there are some uh, good markets around. And, and I, you know, the, the, and, and also I think we have to realize, look, the, the flight from the city really has started a while ago, okay, now we always it never was that bad, and we always had new people moving in. And look, the city is is a great place, and there's a lot of high paying jobs, and there are certain people that can never leave. Most of the people that have left before left for tax reasons, and um, you know were in the type of business where they didn't have factories, they didn't have manufacturing, they didn't have warehouses. You know, like uh, they were personal service business, like 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 hedge funds and money management firms. Pick up. Bring your people or hire new people and, and go down to a low-tax or no-tax state. Um, and from New York, most of them ended up in Florida. From California, they tend to migrate to uh, either Nevada uh, or uh, Texas. And so, you know, there has been the mobility. It, it, we don't know really how many people are going to stay, how many people are going to continue to leave. I think the last number I showed is 240 people approximately a day 
moving out of New York. And will some of them come back? My guess is probably some will. And I remember remember right after 9-11, I had some few people, a few people I knew moved to the Hamptons. Um, you know, said, so that's it. We're out of the city, moved to the Hamptons. I think it was three or four people. And after two years, uh, the, all, all three or four of them had left and come back back to the city. So sure. the people that are used to the city, the city's very hard to leave. And maybe we don't see it as well right now because there's still a lot of things closed. But, you know, like uh, like like theater, okay, like Broadway, like sporting events, you know, like Great sure. Garden. You know, I, 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 saw, I saw yesterday it came out that this is the first year since the 1930s that Radio City Music Hall will be closed and they won't have the Christmas show with the with the rock wow. band. Wow. So yeah. I think those things are, you know, obviously bad, but I imagine when um, there is a vaccine, that that will that will help. Sure. sure. Well, and the fact is, you know, we've we've had a lot of people too asking about timing in the market because, okay, we were we wondered if when the market opened up again, would people be rushing to buy? They rushed down into the market, but they're just not signing contracts. So we're looking at the markers down the road, and we said, is it, you know, after Labor Day, back to school, literally and figuratively, everybody's, you know, back to business as usual. It's a presidential election year. We remember four years ago, things slowed, came to almost to a halt until after the election, and then we were as busy as we could be between mid-November and the end of the year. Yeah. I mean, uh, also, we, also the, the busiest part of the market, and I don't know, Tom Mickey, I think, you know, you've seen this also, the, the the best part of the market for for New York City right now is two million and under. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's been We've very seen it. very we, we very have... busy. Even bidding wars and things like that. The worst end is the top is the top end. Yeah, because everyone yeah, wants the big price. 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 Yeah, we we had uh, through the through the shutdown we had a uh, situation uh, with a multiple bid situation on a on a beautiful uh, apartment uh, in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. Uh, we were able to get twenty thousand dollars above the list price. It, it, it was listed at one nine seven five. We knew it shouldn't have a two in it. Uh, some offers came in around one seven, one eight. We went to a best and final, and they closed uh, a couple of weeks ago at uh, twenty thousand. But that had two things going for it. It's Brooklyn, which is as hot as it can be, and it was a yeah. garden uh, duplex. So it had. It wasn't just outdoor yeah. space. It was so large that it came with a lawnmower. Yeah, and Brooklyn. <laughs> so, and, 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 Brook, and Brooklyn is surely doing much better than Manhattan. So when we talk about yeah, the yeah. city, we're talking broad, but we really should say yeah, Manhattan. Yeah. And by the yeah, way, I have a news flash. I just saw it on my screen. Joe Biden names Kamala Harris as vice presidential pick. Really? Not wow, that's interesting. That's interesting. We've been following that close. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Everybody um, on this call, you can say, I remember where I was when. That's right. Howard Matthews. <laughs> wow. Howard is our uh, d- d- uh, breaking news alert. Um, so right, so we, right. want to just, we, we could probably talk with you guys for the next two hours, but we want to be mindful, you know, to, uh, to keep, keep our, you know, get as many questions as we could. So we have, I, I think that we'd all agree on this, on this call that, you know, the date, the date that the, con- that a contract is signed is the date that, dictates what market somebody bought something in. It doesn't matter if it took you two years to close on a new dev. If you, on the date you signed that contract, that was that market. Correct? Right? We're all on board with that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we have, we have a within, lot of within the, two to four, within two to three weeks, really. Cause yeah, you, know, you could have like, you agree, like the brokers you negotiate between other brokers and then it goes to the attorneys and there's more negotiations. So it's sort of a gray area, sure. but yeah. So, and would we, would you say that the, the last high of the New York market was kind of 2014 to third quarter 2015? That, that's kind of our take. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so we have peak. a lot of, we have a lot of sellers right now who we are doing everything we can to kind of get them out whole. You know, we have, we, as I mentioned, I think earlier, we've got a lot of resale uh, apartments on for both sale and rent to see where, you know, what is going to get the better traction at this time. And the question, you know, we're getting is, do I lower my price now? Do I wait until after Labor Day? Do we wait until after the election? Do we wait until after Christmas? I mean, it, I, I mean, I guess we're asking you guys to look into your uh, crystal ball. I mean, none of us knows for sure, but but can you both provide any kind of insight uh, on that? On that? Uh, well, as I always tell, you know, Howard's crystal ball is in much better shape than mine. Mine's held together with duct tape. But I can tell you, so I can, um, so the way I, the way I, first of all, 
you know, at, to Howard's point earlier, you know, above and below $2 million are two different markets, right? So a lot of sort of prognosticating about the future depends on what market you represent, you know, you're in the middle of. And, uh, and that's sort of number one for me in terms of, you know, how to look at pricing. The other thing is that um, I feel pretty comfortable just based on the last dozen or so years of experience is that the election will again pause activity uh, in the fall after Labor Day, and then we'll see a large release, no matter the party or the candidate, um, as we've seen in the past. So there's a little bit of volatility ahead of us. And, you know, I think you guys are best equipped uh, being, you know, much closer to the transaction than, than at least I am. Um, but I, I still think that, you know, there's some, you know, th this uncertainty is like a wet blanket um, on the market with the, with the uncertainty of COVID, the, uh, uh, you know, how the economy recovers. And I, I think that's, all, it's going to be in our face for the next year or two. And, um, and that means to be more competitive with pricing, which means, uh, you know, the, the pricing today for the sort of the average apartment, you know, may not be what it was last February uh, pre-COVID. You know, I think that's the way to look at it. Yeah. Uh, well, especially I, I, with inventory, especially I agree. with inventory coming up, especially with inventory coming on, that's more competition, right? So mm -hmm. you have to, you have to take that into consideration. But you never really I mean, know, sorry. you really never know about pricing until someone puts the, puts the uh, apartment, the townhouse on the market. You know, we've right. all been wrong. We've all been wrong many times, both in up markets and down markets. And realistically, you know, it, it, it's just we know it's lower. OK, how much lower? I mean, if you look in New York City during for people that signed contracts before COVID and were due to close during COVID. OK, um, the average the average bid and ask was the seller wanted the seller wanted a, uh, you know, a 10 to 15 percent. Excuse me. The buyer wanted a 10 to 15 percent discount, sometimes 20, but mostly you know 10, 15. And of course, the seller didn't want to give anything. And a lot of those deals got done, and they probably averaged close to about 10 percent um, discount from the pre-COVID uh, price. So we know the market's you know probably down at least that, and probably uh, a little bit more than that. Uh, but that's a generality. It's surely not the same on apartments under two million. Uh, but on the higher price product, um, I, I would guess for sure it's down at least 10 percent. Uh, where maybe more? Where, maybe more. where are the yeah. mindset? It's you know it, we're taking a controversial position when people were asking us at the beginning of the shutdown. People who were, saw opportunities with listings that have been on the market for a while, they're asking us what is the COVID discount? How much should I factor in? I'm like what are you what are you talking about? The seven and a half percent. You have no idea what a COVID discount looks like. And the fact is, we still don't know because with all of these contracts signed since we've, you know, gotten back. You don't know the price. <laughs> showing, we don't know the prices. So right. we think that there right. will be some panic sales. There's, you know, there's some blood in the water and the sharks are out there. We got uh, an $8 million offer on an $18 million pen pass. You know, yeah. For, yeah. And wow. we laughed at the pen. Yeah, we, we just wrote back LOL. <laughs> is that a real estate term? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but don't yeah. forget, let's so, also let's also remember the market was soft before COVID. Sure. Yeah, a lot of high, overpriced. Yeah. There was a lot of overpriced inventory on the market Absolutely. before COVID. No Absolutely. And we, but the one thing we saw, 2019. I mean, we're still licking the wounds. Well, the mansion tax. The mansion, the mansion tax, tax and, law, and mansion tax, and it also started with the loss of the state and local tax deductions. Yeah, That's so. absolutely, that is yes, for sure. That was the beginning of it, and 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 the one you know we have to we have to stop taxing the real estate industry. I mean the, the increase in mansion tax, the increase in transfer tax, the discussion of pied a pair tax. It's like enough already, you know. Right. It's, we account for 50% of the city's budget, but uh, it's like, you know, they keep dipping into our... That's, for, that's why, our that's why I said before, that and, and the politics in general of the city and what's been going on um, it surely plays, in my opinion, at least the same uh, discount as the COVID. And now you put the two of them together. And again, the New York, New York COVID-wise, is doing quite well. 
Mm-hmm. Yes. So, yeah, yeah it's uh, one of the best. Yeah, well, yeah, one of the best in in, in the country. Yeah, now. when when even when we got back to showings, once we could finally go back to uh, show properties after June twenty second, you know, Mickey and I had headed back to the city, and we've been going back and forth to uh, on an as needed basis now. But uh, uh, it it felt a lot better than we thought it was. You know, we had some trepidation, yeah. but we did our we did our masks and our distancing, and we signed all the COVID forms for the showings, and you know. Uh, hand sanitizer and, and people were back out and were showing properties. It's like, okay, life is going to go on and, uh, and, and yeah. in a different world. Yeah, and this is going to pass. So, um, right. yeah, we're, we're, we're optimistic. We're optimistic. It's just a, it's a tough moment. And, and, and as you said, I mean, the word uncertainty, uncertainty doesn't bode well for, for anything. So, right. Um, right. Yeah. But we're also big believers. Pent up demand doesn't fizzle away. It will stay pent up until until a vaccine is announced, or uh, you know, when theaters open again, restaurants open again. So we're you know, we're still going to transact business. We're still showing apartments. We're still bringing new listings to market. People need a place to live. People need to sell and move on. So business will continue. But uh, Jonathan, we you know look to you to enlighten us as these things come you know as the as the numbers reveal themselves. So we can yeah. guide our sellers and buyers better because yeah. we have buyers who are hearing what a great time it is to be in the market. And we have one one couple in particular who bid on two apartments and they've been outbid in bidding wars on both. And they right. say, I thought it was a buyer's market. Right, well, right. But, but, right. But not, yeah, right. And that, that's, that's around the million dollar price level. So, um, Jonathan, what is the, uh, we have it in front of us, but what is, what is the exact number, what's the inventory on the market in New York City right now, the number of apartments for, for this moment? Uh, so, okay, so in the, the new reports that I do, the, uh, the numbers are, let me pull up, the, the numbers are not what you're asking me. Um, the actual supply on the market right now, I'm just pulling it up, is, sorry. Yeah, no, we just, I was just concerned because I, I have the paperwork in front of me too, but uh, there's so many numbers on this. <laughs> just, <Yeah. laughs> well, just, oh, so, so here's perspective on inventory. So, you know, the, the inventory numbers in, uh, we track it monthly, uh, just overall inventory, not new listings that came on in the contract, or just overall as well. And at the end of July, there were about 7,800. Hundred uh, Manhattan listings, which are primarily co-op and condo. That's 98% of the housing stock. Um, that uh, that number is still about 25% below the peak that we had in 2009, right after the Lehman collapse, when it was uh, well over 10,000. So, wow. so inventory is still high because it's been averaging over the last four or five years, somewhere around uh, 6,000 units, so we're at 7,800. But it's still mm-hmm. not really that close to the 10,000 that we saw right after Lehman. Very interesting. And, and that's and of course, that number, 7,800, doesn't include the famous, quote-unquote, shadow inventory of new development. Oh, no. Right? No, no. Yeah. No, yeah. that's, yeah. Uh, you know, this is active. You know, what is in, in our face? You know, what we can see. Right. And... Uh, and you know that's you know so so and then on top of it now we we have um, you know uh, the the way I the way I'd look at it is uh, you know we had this surge in contract activity but a lot of that was uh, simply because inventory did, could not come on you were talking about pent up demand but there's also pent up supply where the consumer is ready to list. They're going to list, and then the market locks down, and they wait. And then so instead of it coming on in May, it comes on in August and and comes on with the same person that would have listed in August anyway. So you have this sort of, you know, short-term burst of supply, and that's what we're seeing right now. Sure, sure. And, and Howard, on the topic of, of new development and the shadow inventory, I mean, what what can you – offer in terms of, you know, where, where are we headed with all of the, the, the new dev inventory that ha- has to be absorbed in this market? And, well, and, and the stuff that has yeah, the, good, the, 
Yeah, there, there's quite a bit of new development inventory, but don't forget um, what's going to happen now is you're not going to have any new buildings. You're not going to have mm-hmm. any new building probably for a couple of years. So they're going to get through this inventory, okay, and they'll get through it by uh, an improving market and by also uh, reducing prices. You know, these prices actually you could tell pretty much, you know when they're being reduced, you know, pretty pretty quickly. And uh, we started uh, having some projects reduce prices pre-COVID, you know, going down, you know, 10%, 15%. And we did a lot of deals, okay, yep. uh, you know, in a short, a short period of time. So we know that we know that, and we know today is probably more than that. And uh, the rationale for that is, you know, you know, p- people generally are going to be more aggressive if they need to buy something right away. OK, and maybe mm-hmm. pay a little more than they wanted. But if it's something that's two, three or four years out, they're going to say, well, what am I in a rush for? I'm not going to be able to get it for two or three or four years anyway. So uh, I think, right. Right. So I think that's the way it's going to work. OK. No, uh, and, and where uh, would you offer, you know, to 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 our clients on on the phone? Where where might you suggest the best opportunities are at, at this point? I mean, I guess really case by case with every seller, but yeah, any- yeah, yeah. It depends what neighborhoods they're comfortable in. Uh, look, the Upper East Side, uh, you know, uh, has you know always been a favorite, as has been the West Side um, mm-hmm. for, for new development. Um, the worst market is really the older. Upper East Side co-ops and the older yeah. Upper West Side co-ops, because sure. they only got renovations. It cost a fortune to renovate today, and you have to deal with the board and you have to deal with work rules and so forth. I mean, you know what was always for years considered one of the best buildings in New York City was 740 uh, Park Avenue. Um, uh-huh. And, yeah. and by the way, things that were 40 million dollars a few years ago there, you could buy for 20, 25 million today. So wow. they've already had pre-COVID. They've already had a big price decrease because they weren't what people wanted today. They didn't have the same amenities as the new buildings have, and so forth. Um, they didn't they, experience the boom over, the, you know, uh, past the financial crisis. That you know, essentially, they developed a new competition in luxury, and it was condominiums. And condominiums aren't going away. It was condominiums, and then you had all new towers facing the park with every amenity imaginable. Right. And that's what, uh, you know, people at the high end wanted, and they paid for it. Exactly. Good stuff. All right, gentlemen. Uh, wow, it's, it's – can you believe we're on the phone 40 – it's almost 45 minutes already. This is fun. <laughs> we have to, we have time to goes, do this time goes fast. Time goes fast when you're having fun. We have to yeah. do this quarter. Uh, we had we were so excited, Howard. We had a surprise plan for you, and we uh, unfortunately, due to a, a dispute with the musicians' union, we had to cut the band from today's call. Uh, so, uh, but, so you're not going to sing. You're not going to sing. Well, have to cut your solo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, we'll, we'll we'll tell everybody uh, who's listening that that you know, in all of our town hall meetings with all of the agents, uh, you know, Howard always uh, ends each each um, discussion with a, with an inspiring quote, and he's had a lot of them uh, over these months. Uh, Winston Churchill, I know many times, and uh, John F. Kennedy. But um, because we we come from, you know, we have a background in the uh, in the music business, we, we hung up our microphones a very long time ago, but you do know that, um, you know, our hero is a certain gentleman who was born in Hoboken, New Jersey, <laughs> and so uh, to, to wrap us up here today, we'll say a great big thank you to you, to both uh, you, Howard and Jonathan, for, for joining us and, and uh, talking with us and our clients. And we're going to give the, the final word. We're going to give the final word to Mr. Sinatra because we believe wholeheartedly in New York. New York City is the center of the universe. It is the greatest place on the planet where 8 million people of all walks and stripes and countries and everything live together on top of one another. <laughs> and, and it works for the most part. It works really quite well. So we can't wait to get back to it. And uh, we're going to have Mr. Sinatra sing us out. So thank you all for joining us. And we look forward to talking to you all again soon. Thank you.
you, everybody. Bravo. Bravo. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Stay Bye-bye. safe. Stay safe. Thank you. This does conclude today's conference call. We thank you for your participation and ask that you please disconnect your line.